Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> I know this is the harder one, but uh, I'll try to stick to my time and uh, uh, deliver a, you know, a good talk. So topic is context-driven security. I'm excited to be talking about this topic. Uh, I've been researching on it for the past three years in different, uh, um, under different research uh, agendas. So what I'm going to be presenting today is one of the research uh, interests that I've pursued. So context-driven security, need for a critical shift in threat intelligence. Uh, it's the year 2022, wake up. January has come to an end, it's February. And we can comfortably say that uh, internet has, is now omnipresent. Uh, everything is connected to the internet. Patients have sensors on their bodies, uh, smart homes, healthcare, education, transportation, finance, insurance, electricity, education again. Uh, manufacturing cyber attacks have targeted every single sector. Uh, and I'm, I know that this crowd doesn't need to be convinced about the importance of security and that it needs to touch every single sector that I just mentioned. Uh, but out of curiosity, I wanted to look up which is the, you know, the top most, the, the, the most important threat vector which impacts all of these industries that I just mentioned. So I'm going to take a minute and show you the dreaded histogram. Malware continues to be the most effective uh, attack vector across all the sectors I mentioned. I'm not going to show you what the rest of them are. They're not important for this talk. Uh, for us research, researchers, what is also important is that the, the topic that we are pursuing, like malware research in my case, uh, we also need to get data to you know, help uh, with evaluations to support uh, you know, the research that we are doing. So therefore, malware research was an interesting topic for me. Uh, so let's center uh, the malware threat impact on enterprise networks uh, for the purpose of this talk, but the impact of this research is across sectors. And uh, as we all know, machine learning has done uh, an outstanding job with both uh, defending and preventing uh, against cyber attacks uh, emanating from this specific threat vector. Um, in fact, an AI visionary, Arthur Samuel, defines machine learning as uh, the ability to learn without programming, without explicitly programming, and with data. Because machine learning uses data and learns from it. So this, uh, I know many of you have a background in machine learning, but not all of you. Uh, so the training phase uh, is, you know, when you train the, the machine learning model, with this knowledge that you've gathered from the data. And machine learning, because machine learning algorithms, so there's data, there's algorithms, and they form models. Uh, the algorithms can, can reason uh, the properties of previously unseen samples because they've learned from the data. In malware detection, uh, a previously unseen sample could be a new file that will be, uh, that will be you know, uh, testing this model that we just learned. Uh, and you will find out whether the, the, the network was indeed protected against this new file, this malware file. So it is important to emphasize the importance of uh, the, the, the importance of uh, the data-driven nature of this approach. And uh, so, like in the training phase, a model created for malware attack detection and prevention. Uh, it depends on the data, and it, it has seen during the training phase. So that's an important concept uh, that needs to be kept in mind uh, so that it can determine uh, which features are statistically significant or relevant uh, for predicting if the file was actually malignant or malicious or benign. So the statistical significance is very important and that comes from the data that the model has been trained on. Uh, so that's uh, something to keep in mind while I continue with the talk. And most companies have used machine learning or are using machine learning um, to, to, to some degree in their intrusion detection and prevention systems. But machine learning has its limitations, obviously, because machine learning is hard. That is the topic of this, this, uh, this panel. 
and we are going to be talking about those limitations and the circumstances where these limitations uh, are more pronounced. So we are increasingly recognizing, recognizing these limitations and some of these challenges uh, come in the form of false alerts. False alerts, uh, false positives, false negatives. False negatives happen when a model mistakes a malicious label for a benign file and fal false positives happen when a harmless file or a URL or an indicator uh, that is being scanned in the model that we just talked about, the trained model uh, that I just talked about, that model incorrectly identifies it as malicious. That's false positives. So together they, call, they are called false alerts. And they can carry um, serious consequences for users. You can imagine that. Right? So you will continue to see benign files and if they're tagged as or labeled as malicious, somebody needs to take care of that. Those, those people are SOC analysts. And uh, you would say that we can impose high requirements on the model and uh, both you know, the machine learning model and the metrics that are defining uh, you know, the thresholds, whether this will be uh, labeled as malicious or benign, you can increase uh, those thresholds or imp you know, impose higher requirements for your models. Uh, even then, even then it, is, it is very difficult to get rid of uh, you know, false positives and false negatives. In fact, uh, uh, I was looking around for some specific uh, data around this in top companies, the, the products that they build. Uh, each product sees terabytes of data every day. And even if a fraction of that is false alerts, you can imagine the amount of time, money, goes into uh, analyzing why are we seeing these false alerts. And they can't just let, let pass uh, those uh, alerts. And what they cause, because of the amount, they cause uh, alert fatigue. The analysts is not able to uh, manually uh, analyze those alerts uh, after a point. So, Problem. Uh, now we've understood what we're going to be targeting. Let's talk about, uh, um, let's shift gears uh, towards solutions. So um, that's what this, this research I'm going to talk about is focused towards. Uh, but breaking down the problem into two, P1, P2. P1 is lack of enough representative data to test rules. And that's why I was emphasizing on the training uh, uh, aspect of the, uh, the learning model, that if there is no representation uh, in the machine learning model, it will be very challenging for the model to actually uh, to find that, uh, the, you know, to, to be able to label uh, a new file. And then the other problem is deluge of false alerts that I just talked about. There are too many uh, to be dealt with. Even if you have prioritized them from low, medium, hard, and focusing only on the high ones, even then there are just too many. So for problem number one, lack of enough representative data. Uh, one solution that uh, we have, uh, in, with that, that we are pursuing is continuous learning uh, and then add most recent data. So uh, new attack vectors, new vulnerabilities keep coming in. Uh, they're, they're mo they're, the way they are attacking, those, those attack patterns also keep changing. Uh, the vulnerability might remain the same, but the, but the attack pattern might change. So how do we include that into our learning model? Well, you increase the data that is being used to train the model. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that in, in the upcoming slides. And the other one is triaging alerts. How do you triage alerts? How do you prioritize even the high priority uh, alerts? Uh, this, is, this talk is about context, adding context to security. So uh, the direction that we have taken is that uh, you provide context to your alerts. Focusing on the first one first, continuous learning uh, at most recent data. So continuous learning, how does that happen? Uh, they, we found that uh, uh, so enterprises are constantly you know, uh, analyzing their internal telemetry is coming from logs, uh, network data, host-based data, all of that is getting analyzed. There is an additional source of data that can be included in that analysis, and that comes from the internet. There are lots of uh, open source threat information uh, that is easily and uh, 
from what I've seen, uh, freely available to a degree. There is noise in the free uh, version, but that's what I was able to access. Um, so free, freely available open, set, uh, open source uh, threat intelligence uh, written by, sorry, I should have moved, that, moved on to this one. So open source threat intelligence uh, aggregation is what uh, we, we, are, we, are, we are pursuing as a way to increase the, the learning of the models uh, by increasing the data. And this data is most recent. And how do we get that? I'll, I'll talk about that. So these, uh, the open source intelligence actually uh, covers, is written by researchers on trending attacks uh, and what are the defense mechanisms against those attacks. Uh, these might be opinions, these might be blogs, these might be uh, actual threat reports. And at the same time, these might, these might exist in the dark web where people have recently encountered uh, uh, you know, a new payload or uh, a, a, a novel way of, uh, yeah, of using an existing vulnerability. So all that getting discussed, we can aggregate that data. And that's what uh, open source threat intelligence uh, aggregation means. And these can be very useful, although unstructured. Uh, so I want to show you what I'm referring to. This is more of uh, a more, you know, uh, official and a, a, a better version of what threat reports are and threat intelligence looks like uh, from McAfee. And this is on uh, the sunburst uh, Trojan. And uh, so what they basically, uh, in it, the, the information that is included in, the, in these threat reports is uh, how the, the attack was discovered, uh, the, the pattern, the attack pattern of that specific malware, uh, the vulnerabilities that were used, uh, the indicators of compromise, and uh, attack patterns and so on and so forth. So although these are unstructured reports, uh, these are essentially opinions written by security analysts who have varying degrees uh, of expertise and, uh, and you know, also based on the information available in hand at that point of time when they wrote that report. So this is an essential source of uh, new information that we can gather. And you won't get this from uh, binary and, and you know, from, from binaries by static analysis or behavioral analysis or dynamic analysis. These are written in uh, human, you know, understandable language and covers context which otherwise wouldn't be possible to capture in code. So that's the advantage that we see in using uh, this kind of threat information. So our uh, research uses knowledge graphs to capture this kind of information. Uh, and uh, it's a significant endeavor. Uh, it's the data is unstructured. How do you know what to capture, how to capture, how accurate that, uh, uh, that, uh, that the data is that you've captured from these unstructured sources of information. Uh, and it requires multidisciplinary expertise uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in, in the domain, in machine learning, in natural language processing, information extraction and uh, of course about security. So let's first talk about how do we generate a knowledge graph. So first I'm gonna show you what a knowledge graph looks like. So for, I know it's a little small, uh, but I'll try. Uh, so these are small dots which are vertices of a large graph, uh, varying in sizes, and these are connected by edges. And these edges are essentially a relationship between, between two, uh, between two of these vertices, which means that these two vertices have a relationship. There is a context which exists between this circle and this circle. So this is different from a generic graph that you might have studied in maybe a graph analytics class or graph theory class. And towards the, the right of this is actually a legend. Uh, this was generated using Neo4j. And what this legend is, uh, so for example, the, the beautiful orange colored circle is about malware. So these orange circles that you're seeing are malware, uh, which was recognized or uh, the data about it was extracted from the reports that I just showed you. Uh, the light colored ones are the light orange is malware family. And then there, are, there is location based information. Uh, where, was this, where was the impact of the malware uh, found, uh, what vulnerabilities were used to compromise the platform, and so on and so forth. I believe it, all of this was captured only using threat reports. 
And this was uh, from 25 threat reports. And, and basically, uh, just a handful of malware information was collected. Um, and then there is another one, just so I can make the, uh, the concept a bit clearer. So there is, all, all of these are malwares which are connected to one another, or they're aliases, because not every security company will be using the same name. Uh, so you need to capture the aliases so, so that you can capture other details and then combine them and form a knowledge graph which can be used for, excuse me, used for further analysis. Now, now, now let's pick one example. So Flubot malware has picked up again. Uh, it's been around for the past three, four years. Uh, hard to tell when, um, because there is always some report which says that, oh, a, a version of it or an alias of it existed a year ago. So I know it's a small one, so I decided to zoom in. Now, what you're seeing in front of you, these dark colored oranges, is one of them is Flubot, and the others are aliases of Flubot, Flubot malware. Uh, and then there is, you know, same information, location, when was, when was uh, this flu bot, uh, you know, detected in a certain location, uh, and, and, and name of the, the, uh, the different countries, uh, and the impact on devices, and so on and so forth. But what is really interesting are these blue colored bubbles. What these blue colored bubbles are, attack patterns. Attack patterns which were captured from these threat reports, and combining these will give you, from multiple threat reports, combining these can give you the entire kill chain of this specific malware. And that's what the biggest uh, takeaway or biggest advantage of using knowledge graphs is that by using this unstructured information written in, uh, in a language understood by humans, you can capture this kind of details about that malware. And uh, extrapolating that, consider many such malwares as part of a very large knowledge graph. Uh, all of this combined can tell you uh, attack patterns or infer attack patterns with little information as in when a malware threat is evolving. That's the advantage of using knowledge graphs and that's uh, what this research is pursuing. Okay, now adding context. We talked about uh, uh, gathering data from the internet, uh, and how do we add context so that essentially we want to help the SOC analysts, right? Uh, so problem number two was adding context, but to get context, you need to add context to your models. If you're not adding context, how will you get context as an output? So uh, provenance, reasoning, and trust. These are some of the ways where context can be added and the, the, the areas that I pursued so far. Um, so provenance can come from Wikidata. Wikidata is, an, is a very reliable source uh, of uh, information. What can be done is the knowledge graph that I just showed you, those bubbles. If you click on one of those bubbles, uh, we have connected that to the, to the concepts which have been described in Wikidata. You click on it, and it will show you the description of a specific malware or a location, and that's automated. It has automatically been connected to Wikidata. Now you would wonder why is it important, and I'll tell you a very interesting example. So there was this um, attack on Google a couple of years ago, Aurora. Uh, you might have heard of it. So when you're extracting information which is called Aurora, the extraction models will not understand that Aurora was actually a campaign. It will call Aurora as the Northern, uh, Northern Lights in, I think in Ireland, somewhere, right? Uh, so that's, that confusion is, uh, is obvious, and we want to minimize those kind of, uh, those confusions when we are automating our systems. So Wikidata essentially was able to easily, uh, you know, give us that uh, definition of Aurora the campaign, not Aurora the Northern Lights. The other one is open source threat intelligence uh, sources. So these threat reports are coming from somewhere, right? And that somewhere can become our um, anchor. Uh, many of these reports come from uh, prestigious companies, Kaspersky, Microsoft uh, Security Reports, uh, McAfee, and so on and so forth. Uh, that can be tied. In fact, we have tied that 
to the knowledge graph and that provides provenance and, and for a security analyst it's important uh, to at the time of uh, analyzing uh, false positives where did we get this information from it's it's a very quick way for them to go back and look at or in fact trace the alert to the source of the information so that's why provenance is important reasoning comes from knowledge graphs and ontology we we followed the ontology or taxonomy based approach because um, because we created knowledge graphs with certain questions in mind. And those questions can be answered if you give them a structure. Uh, and structure comes from uh, classes. Classes can be, uh, can be defined in ontologies. So I don't want to go into that because of uh, the limited time we have. And then there is trust. That's an area that I'm still pursuing. How do you add trust to, to the models which are extracting data as well as to, uh, to the source of information? Uh, so how do we get from, how much time do I have? One minute, okay. Okay, okay. So how do we get from here to here? I think that's uh, a valid question. I already talked about uh, ontologies, and then there's in, information extraction models, uh, named entity recognition and relation extraction. Uh, so it's, it's a multidisciplinary research uh, uh, where you need, in, uh, well, NLP. Uh, and then there's disambiguation, co-referencing, and deduplication. Uh, with this large uh, corpus of data comes noise, there, there comes duplications, there comes pronouns. So you need to uh, clear them, them all up so that your knowledge graph has minimal noise. Uh, this is the um, architecture for the first Malware knowledge graph that we created. I don't want to get into it, but it mostly talks, uh, it mostly covers what I already talked about. Um, so how do we use this knowledge graph? Uh, we have a case study in one of the papers. Uh, so you pose a query to this knowledge graph, like uh, there's an indicator of compromise, coronavirus themed attacks, and the relation, which is the line that, I, that, that, that uh, is connecting these, these circles, targets. So you have a query coronavirus streamed attacks targets, and what it will give you is a set of results. And these are the options that are potential answers. And you get that with a confidence score, and along with that also the data source from which uh, this information was extracted. So this is how we are adding context to the results uh, of our predictions, uh, if that data exists. And if that data does not exist, then it becomes inference. So parting notes, uh, end of the talk, is we need to go beyond measuring the performance of models uh, using accuracy, precision, F1 scores. We want to be able to help uh, analysts by inferring with confidence and context. Uh, and then uh, that's the research frontier. It's triaging at scale and automation. So I'll be happy to take questions now. Thank you.